Would you please pray with me? O risen Christ, open us to the power of your resurrection as we hear it proclaimed anew this day, that we too might rise to new life in you. Amen. He came back. This is what each Easter church member Florence Brown whispers in my ear with astonishment. He came back. There are so many astonishing things about Easter that God resurrected Jesus from the dead. Surely astonishing. But as a clergy friend of mine reminds me, is it any more astonishing than God creating the world? If God is Lord of all, wouldn't God be Lord of the living and the dead? Theologian Harvey Cox points out that while restoring a dead person to life is an astonishing blow at mortality, the restoration of a crucified man to life is an astonishing blow against the system that executed him. As astonishing as both of these proclamations are, that Christ is risen and that a crucified Christ is risen, I am with Florence. What most astonishes me about Easter is that Jesus came back to us. After the abuse he received, after the lies people told about him, and the conspiracies they mounted against him, after being unjustly condemned to death by the state, crucified by the crowd, and betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his disciples, why would Jesus return to the very people who went after him, turned against him, or let him down when he needed them most? This is the question I'd like for us to reflect on this morning. Did Jesus return to us, as Harvey Cox says, to strike a blow at the system that executed him? Did Jesus return to prove God as victor over all? To gloat triumphantly? To get revenge? To correct the lies? To get the last word? To place blame where it truly belonged? We sing about some of these things in our Easter hymns, don't we? These, however, are not the things we actually see the resurrected Jesus saying or doing in Scripture. Why then did Jesus, raised from the dead, come back to his disciples? Jesus' crucifixion is what Professor of Old Testament David Carr calls Christianity's founding trauma. We know that the crucifixion was a trauma intended to obliterate, to put an end to Jesus and the movement he led. And yet this trauma has become the founding event of Christianity. To say this, however, is incomplete and perhaps misleading. Because today what we know about trauma is that more often than not, trauma does not usually end anything. It usually engenders more violence, and that violence perpetuates more trauma. For victims, perpetrators, and bystanders alike, when it comes to the trauma of violence, all three can get caught up in its cycle. The study of trauma has taught us that trauma can happen to groups as well as individuals, and that personal trauma, social trauma, national trauma can be perpetuated cyclically, generation after generation. Could it be 
that the resurrected Jesus came back to break the cycle of trauma, to show us how, to show us this possibility. This past week, at the trial of Derek Chauvin, the police officer charged in the killing of George Floyd, the jury heard testimony of bystanders, many of whom were teenagers and children. Giving her testimony, 18-year-old Darnella Frazier, whose video captured the final nine minutes and 29 seconds of George Floyd's life, spoke about how the trauma she witnessed last May affected her. She spoke about lying awake at night, apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. She went on to say, when I look at George Floyd, I look at my dad. I look at my brothers. I look at my uncles and cousins because they are all black. I have a black father. I have a black brother. I have black friends. And I look at that, and I look at how they could have been, that could have been one of them. Reading her testimony, I could not help but pray that Christ would show Darnella Frazier a way out of the cycle of violence and trauma she has experienced. It takes a great deal of spiritual and psychological maturity not to get swept up in the cycle of violence, to resist its grip. One of the spiritual challenges is not to seek a scapegoat for the trauma one has experienced. As a black American woman, Felicia Murrell, a writer at the Center for Action and Contemplation, writes very personally about this. She writes, it might feel good after years of being shackled to scarcity, victimhood, poverty, suspicion, and inferiority, to project onto a scapegoat, even holding the system complicit, the burden of hundreds of years of pain. We feel righteous, we long for someone else to feel what we feel, or at the very least, to validate that it's okay for us to feel what we feel. Once given the space to acknowledge those feelings, we cry the tears our ancestors could not. We feel the fatigue they were not allowed to feel. We give in to the vulnerability that would have cost them their lives. What Felicia Merle has discovered in her spiritual work is that when she gives into this vulnerability, but without looking for resolution, without blaming, without finger pointing, without doggedly trying to control the outcome of public opinion, a spiritual alchemy happens. Something transforms enabling her to be honest about humanity's failings and abuses of power, enabling her to ask herself, can I acknowledge the monster side of my humanity, lament it, forgive it, and let it go, realizing that it may cycle around again? One of the reasons why trauma perpetuates more violence is that we blame other people. From our own history, we know that for centuries, Christians blamed Jews for killing Christ. No doubt this fed the anti-Semitism that culminated in the systematic murdering of an estimated six million Jews during the Holocaust. And no doubt, the trauma of the Holocaust has been perpetuated for several decades in the violence of Israel and Palestine. Over the millennia, 
Christians have played every role in that cycle of violence. Victims, perpetrators, and bystanders. And for those Christians living today in Nazareth and Bethlehem, again, victims and bystanders. There are many theories as to why we have this urge to blame. In writing about the history of blaming other people, writer Charlie Campbell muses on the psychology of scapegoating. He concludes that for the most part we do it to live with ourselves. Charlie Campbell thinks that in order to live with ourselves, we create a narrative of our lives that makes sense to us and that fits with our concept of ourselves. We even shape our memories accordingly, keeping some and discarding others. Most of us think of ourselves as decent people, he writes. In order to preserve this concept of ourselves, sometimes we seek to blame others and hold others responsible for things that conflict with our self-understanding. In other words, we blame other people to reduce our cognitive dissonance. It makes sense to me that we are always seeking to reduce cognitive dissonance and, escape, and that scapegoating is one of the ways in which we do this. And while I would agree that ordinarily we think of ourselves as decent people, I suspect that when it comes to truly traumatic events, those physically and emotionally violent events that lie beyond a person's ability to master at the time, we are less concerned to preserve the concept of ourselves as decent people than we are to tell ourselves that we are in control. And if we are not in control, that someone else is. When a truly traumatic event takes place, I believe that the concept we strive to hold on to more than anything is that we or someone is in control and therefore to blame. This past week, I was reminded of the life story of poet Gregory Orr. Gregory Orr grew up in upstate New York in rural Hudson Valley, where one of the rites of passage was going hunting. When he was 12 years old, he went on his first hunting trip with his father and younger brother. On that hunting trip, he accidentally shot and killed his brother. That event wiped out all the meaning from his life. For four years, he lived without any meaning at all, without any hope at all. And then he met Mrs. Irving, who helped him to discover poetry, a way to remake a world with words. Gregory Orr's poetry is anchored autobiographically in the trauma he experienced as a 12-year-old. In speaking about the traumatic event, he remembers understanding, even at that young age, that families fall apart after experiences like this, that there is this need we have to blame and somehow not take in that this is an extreme version of the fact that being an embodied being, a human being, living in a body, involves some jeopardy. To be human, he says, is to be continually at risk. Risk is our existential condition. None of us knows what's going to happen next. Gregory Orr writes in the tradition of lyric poetry. Core to lyric poetry is the perspective of the personal I. Writing poetry in the first person allows a person to speak, to say, I had this experience, not just to others, 
but also to oneself. All too often, when something traumatic happens, however, there is a huge silencing of the self, not just by the world around us, but from within. And then, unfortunately, too often, we create a pathological story to make sense of that trauma. We say to ourselves, it was my fault. I am to blame. I am in control. Or we say, someone else is to blame. It was someone else's fault. Someone else is in control. For the sake of protecting ourselves from the utterly vulnerable recognition that to be human is to be flesh and blood, pierceable and vincible, to not be in control, we create either story, both ultimately pathological, with the potential to perpetuate more violence, more trauma. I have no doubt that for Jesus' disciples, his crucifixion was the greatest trauma of their lives. I imagine within them the emotions vying to be felt, held, and expressed. They must have been so full of sorrow, horror, and regret. While sorrow and horror might be able to find shared expression, regret, I think, is more personal. So personal that I worry that regret can burrow itself more deeply into our psyches, our bodies, hidden away for safekeeping. Regret for what I did or what I did not do, what I should have done or should not have done. Regret can turn into what Gregory Orr calls a pathological story. But before the disciples can tell themselves, it was my fault, I am to blame, or it was your fault, you are to blame, or it was their fault, they are to blame. The resurrected Jesus came back to them. And he shows them what it feels like to be forgiven. And he remakes their world, which only two days ago had been wiped away of all its meaning. And he does so with a particular alchemy called divine grace. He breaks the cycle of trauma, not once and for all, but when the cycle comes around again, we know what to do because Jesus came back to us. Alleluia. Amen.